Okay, so this is lecture 5.2, and that's about orbits and stabilizers. So, group actions on one hand seem to be very simple, very natural, but on the other hand they go with their own bunch of terminology, new ideas, and uh, some of them are rather subtle. So uh, don't be surprised if it takes a while to get used to it, but after you get used to it, it actually simplifies a lot thinking about groups. And uh, you might wonder why we uh, didn't start discussing them much um, before, and the answer is no reason. Maybe we should have done it. So, uh, okay, so let's suppose we have a group G acts on X. So G acts on X, uh, and then I can ask, okay, what can I say about this action? By the way, usual notation is sometimes G acts on X, this little circle. So let's look at uh, my set. And many times already we have considered this graphs appearing like how G does something. So this was always graphs of group acting on something actually, and you will see that very soon. So you can take any element of X, and you can see where it can go by different elements of G, and you get a bunch of different points where you can send it. Uh, it might happen that you can not send it somewhere, so there may be a point in your set where just uh, uh, no element uh, sends X to this point. But maybe you can send it somewhere else. It might happen that there is a point which is just fixed all elements of G, just send it back, and it's not connected to anything. And so you get your set disjoint into this kind of connected components. Components where you can send every element everywhere, and um, between which you cannot move uh, via your group G. And that's really something very important, and these things are called orbits. So, uh, let me do it now formally. So, formally such things are usually done with equivalence relations, as you very well know. So, definition. So, uh, so uh, consider an equivalence relation. So, consider uh, a relation on X. On X, where you say that two points X1 is in relation, whatever this relation is, you can do reachable or something, uh, to x2 uh, if there exists an element g in g such that g x1 equals to x2. So this is just a relation meaning some pairs, but then you easily see that that's an equivalence relation. So this is an equivalence relation. relation. And uh, the proof is straightforward, just x is equivalent to x because you can take identity and that sends x to x. So uh, x is equivalent to y, then there exists this g such that gx equals to y, but then uh, by the group action axioms you know that g inverse gx equals g inverse y, and that's x. And so there exists g inverse which sends y to x, so y is equivalent to x. Um, and finally, the same way, you know, that x is equivalent to y, y is equivalent to z, then x is equivalent to z, and that's because if something sends x to y and something else sends y to z, then you just multiply them and you get x goes to z. So, very simple, that's an equivalence relation, and classes of equivalence are called orbits. So classes of equivalents are called orbits. So in this section you have three orbits. Um, okay, let's consider something else. So for instance you can take, a, remember we had this tetrahedron, and you have S4, um, acts on, on vertices of 
tetrahedron, but also, so also, uh, S4 acts uh, on the set, on the set, let's say E of edges. So, though this action on vertices has clearly one orbit, every vertex can be moved to any. What about S4 and edges? I mean, that starts to be slightly more interesting, but if you think about it, yeah, you can just move any edge to any edge by rotation. So it has just one orbit. One orbit. So one orbit means any element goes to anywhere. Um, and uh, next you can look at, for instance, you can do the same as four acts on pairs of edges. And then you can start to think, okay, how many orbits are there? And if you have a pair of edges, then of course you have a special pair where your edge just repeats twice. And these are on such pair, this is one of the orbits. So pairs of edges, uh, there are, um, okay, it depends. Let, let's say not oriented, then you don't have this thing at all. So pairs of edges, there are six choose two, uh, which is uh, uh, 15, I hope. And uh, let's see how many orbits do we have. So we have all these 16 uh, um, pairs of edges. And then you have opposite edges. So uh, you have an orbit of size 3, which are just pairs of opposite edges. And remember, we already saw that our group acts on these three elements. And, and that was just uh, uh, this homomorphism from S4 to S3. So that's one orbit here. Uh, corresponding to pairs of opposite edges. And then there are another orbit corresponding to pair of adjacent uh, edges. And if you look at pair of adjacent ed edge, then uh, uh, you can easily move by rotation any of them to any of them. And how many of them are there? Four faces, and each face contains uh, three such pairs, so there are 12 pairs, and they form another orbit. So you have an action on 15 elements, but actually there is a separate action on three elements, separate action on 12 elements, and that just kind of, you just group these two actions together. So this one is interesting, this one is not very interesting, quite boring. And homomorphism from S4 to S12 you get is, yeah, some, some inclusion. And this homomorphism is interesting. So you probably start to see that kind of, okay, any group acts on a set with arbitrary many elements. I mean, you can just take all elements being just identity everywhere. But if you want your set to act, uh, group act on a set with small number of elements, uh, in a way that it's just one orbit, that becomes subtle. So each such map will give you an interesting homomorphism to a set and so on and so forth. And these things start to be more rare and more uh, interesting to look at. Okay, so maybe I need to say, uh, uh, so let me denote, so orb, um, sorry. so orb will denote the number of orbits, number of orbits, orbits. Okay, that will be my notation for, for number of orbits. And here it's three, and here it's two, and, and um, yeah. Okay, so um, let's look a little bit deeper in uh, what those orbits look like. Okay, maybe before that, just one new definition. So, definition, so action of G on X is transitive. Um, if it has one orbit. So, in some sense, that's the most interesting kind of actions, because it has more orbits, you can just separately look at each orbit as an action on its own. Um, but also, this is used uh, often colloquially uh, when you want to say that Okay, there is an action of a group on something and it's transitive and that's something important. So, here are a few examples. So, examples are... Um, 
like um, uh, like uh, for instance um, GLN of V acts transitively on uh, the set of vectors uh, sorry of non-zero vectors vectors so uh, any non-zero vector can go to any non-zero vector by a linear map and that's a fundamental property of linear maps but also for instance GLN of V acts transitively uh, on the set of bases of V. So instead of looking at just vectors, you can look at all collections, sets of vectors which form a basis and Every basis will go to every basis by an isomorphism. And moreover, if you remember, in linear algebra, there was a theorem. You have one basis, you have another, you can always send one to another by an isomorphism. So GLN acts transitively on the set of bases of V. And also you can say that SN acts transitively uh, on the set 1 to N. Uh, but also, also, for instance, on the set of pairs, of pairs, and you need to take uh, maybe ordered pairs, but with i not equal to j, just this pairs. Sn also sends any pair to any pair, triples as well. Anyways, so. These are kind of interesting examples of these transitive actions, and you will see later uh, how important that might be. Um, okay, so next idea uh, which I want to explain is um, basically let's look at just one orbit more carefully. Or actually, maybe let's look at. So suppose G acts on X. So then we have some picture where you have this X and you have a bunch of orbits. So here you have a bunch of orbits, like, like an orbit. Here you have an orbit. Here you have an orbit. That's a typical kind of picture. And, and your group permutes them inside and it doesn't move orbits between each other. So, um, suppose you have some element little x is inside the big set x. So, of course, the natural thing to look at are just elements of your group which fix x. So, very important definition. So, stabilizer of a point x in x is a set which we will denote stabilizer of x or people also write g sub x and this is a set of all elements in the group such that this element of the group fixes x. Yeah, I'm sorry, I said g of x, you can say g times x, that's the same thing. You can say g x is equal to x. So these are elements of your group which don't touch the point. So, um, okay. Why is this interesting? Because it's a subgroup. So, uh, a fact is that G sub X is a subgroup of G. And the reason is very simple because, I mean, imagine you have G and H are inside uh, gx and gh applied to x is the same as g applied to h applied to x but that's g applied to x which is x so composition of two elements is there and if gx is x uh, then you can just multiply it on g inverse it implies g inverse of x is x so uh, and identity x is x and now we have checked everything so it's a subgroup 
So basically, what happens is that you have your set G, and then for every point x1, x2, x3, x4, you have tons of subgroups, gx1, gx2, gx3, gx4, which are like all interesting subgroups of G. So you see how rich group actions are. You have a group action, you first get homomorphism to SN just simultaneously. In case it has a bunch of orbits, you have a lot of different other actions on the smaller subsets. You get more homomorphisms to little SNs, but also you have this um, stabilizers. And you might say, are they kernels of homomorphisms? And the answer, no, they are not. They're just fixing one point. So not kernels of homomorphisms. So, really interesting, what's going on here? Okay, so uh, here is a very important uh, fact, which is called sometimes orbit stabilizer lemma. So, um, orbit stabilizer lemma. So, suppose G acts on X. And let's suppose we have some little point, X and X. So, then there exists a bijection between orbit of little x. So let me denote it by O sub x. That's some subset of x. These are just all elements. These are by definition just all elements g, x for g and g. These are all images of the point under x. And on the other hand, you have set of left cosets g g x so left cosets with respect to a stabilizer are in bijection with points of the orbit okay how do we do that that's actually completely trivial so proof. Before even giving any examples, let me just give you a proof. So proof is completely straightforward. So, I mean, let's just draw a picture. So you have this big set X and you don't care about that, you just care about your orbit. And you have X, GX, so you have this orbit here, uh, G2X, whatever. Uh, and then you have this cosets. Uh, 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 G sub X, G1, G sub X, d -d 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 cosets. So, where are you going to send an element of the orbit? So, we need a bijection. So, uh, let's see. How would we do that? So, let's do this way. So, I will do this way. So, let me call this bijection, uh, this map F. So, F from G, GX set of cosets to uh, O sub x just takes a coset g g x. That's a typical example of a left coset, and you send it. Guess where? To g times x. And you might feel, but like, wait a second. I mean, you can. So, so first question is why this map is well defined. So f is well defined because. For every h in gx, gh x is the same as gx because <laughs> h is in stabilizer. So stabilizer are points which fix x, and so gh x is gx. So what it means? It means that we have a map, and that's well defined. And uh, uh, so f is f is surjective by construction. I mean, if you want to have 
your you any point of the orbit is of this type so take the corresponding coset and send it there so also f is injective injective and this is slightly less trivial because i mean you cannot just you know these are uh, sets you cannot divide so you need to actually check its injective and suppose g1x equals to g2x but then g2 inverse g1x is fixing s so g2 inverse g1 is inside the stabilizer so the coset g1 gx is the same as coset g2 gx and that proves the statement so that's the statement and um basically this gives a very important insight in what group actions look like because imagine you have a group action and you want to understand what is an orbit what is this action looks like in terms of your group and then you say okay at least there is a subgroup gx and at least points of the orbit are in bijection with this cosets soon enough we will see that there is an action of a group on a set of cosets where you will kind of see that this is basically a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between transitive actions and, and uh, 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 subgroups of G. Uh, but, um, mm, yeah, we'll do it later. So, anyways, uh, what is the corollary of that? So, the, there is a very fascinating corollary. So, let me formulate uh, the corollary. Um, okay, so corollary... And I will say just two things. So number one. So suppose that G acts on X. Um, then the size of the orbit equals to the index of the stabilizer. And of course, uh, formally to say it's size, you need probably to say everything is finite, but if it's not infinite, it's not finite, you will have a bijection between these two sets. Uh, uh, so index of a stabilizer is the same as size of the orbit. Uh, that's just because we had a bijection before. But second thing is kind of more straight, I mean, it follows from here, but it's even more remarkable. So uh, if g is finite then length of any orbit of g divides the order of g so length of any orbit divides the order of g so what it means, it means that if, for instance, you have a group like S3 acts on anything, literally any set, it can have orbits of length 1, fixed points, 2, 3, or 6 nothing else just because no other numbers divide s3 so s3 cannot act on something and have an orbit of size 5 that doesn't happen or for instance if you have z over pz acts on anything any set uh, all orbits have size one or p so either fixed points or p elements in the orbit so that's also very very interesting and now i want to look at maybe two applications one of them is a little bit artificial uh and the other is actually uh, uh very uh very interesting so the first one so both of them are from homework so the first one is from homework one and I just remind you as a picture that in this problem we were proving that for any you have some element x in G and then the statement was that if you take x to the power of the order of G you get identity and of course now we know you have a cyclic group generated by x so 
the order of x will be the order of this group, and the order of any subgroup divides the order of g, and this is what we used here. But if you think about it, so what we did, we looked at the following action. So we looked at, so we looked at a group generated by x, uh, uh, which is a subgroup of G, acting on G by multiplication. And then we had these pictures, remember? So we had these pictures where you have some element G1, and then you can multiply it on G, and then you can multiply it on G again, and that's the same as multiply on G squared. So from our modern perspective, it's more like action of the whole group generated by, sorry, by G. Whatever, G. G. Uh, uh, by G here. And what we got? We got that there is some orbit. And then we proved that there is another orbit. And we looked at these orbits, and they all had the same number of elements. And this is how we deduced that the order of uh, G powers the order of G is identity. But these were just the orbits of this action of a cyclic group on G by multiplication. We will discuss this action uh, even more. Um, ah, by the way, uh, let, let's actually do it right now, uh, uh, because here is another kind of observation. So remember, we had this Cayley theorem. And Cayley theorem was that every subgroup is a subgroup, every finite G is finite, G is finite, then G is isomorphic to a subgroup. of Sn. And remember how we did it. So we take all elements of G, just wrote them down, G1, Gn, and then we said, okay, so we have multiplication of G times G to G. But now imagine you just denote this by x. Consider one of these g's as, as a group and another as just a set, and then you have a group action, which takes every element of g, send it to g. And then we have a group action of g on itself by multiplication. So, by our lemma from previous class, we have a homomorphism from g to s, where you have the number of elements of G. And that's exactly what we constructed in homework one and in subsequent lecture. And the Kelly theorem was that this is, uh, this is an isomorphism. And the reason was, okay, they, uh, because, uh, sorry, that's, it's an injective map. And the reason was, imagine some element of the group fixes everything, then G times G1, G times G2, everything is, is fixed. In particular, G times identity is, is identity, so G is identity. So, uh, but now you see such things start to become completely obvious. So Lagrange theorem is obvious, Cayley theorem is obvious. So remember there was another kind of complicated problem and homework about conjugation and the center of a P group. Let's now go through that stuff. So that also becomes completely immediate when you do, uh, when you do this uh, group actions. Okay, so now let's let's do some other interesting applications. So let me say applications to uh, P groups. Oh, I mean, that's all so cheap when you have this stabilizers and conjugation, and, uh, sorry, and, and uh, group actions and so on. So consider a group G. So acts G acts on G by multiplying on elements of G, but also it acts on another way. G acts on G uh, by sending every element G in G to an inner automorphism. Uh, I don't remember the notation, let's say Psi G from G to G, sending X to G, X, G inverse. So group G 
acts by sending any element to this automorphism, that's a bijection from G to G, that gives you a group action. So in other words, you have G times G to G, but the rule now, take G, take X, and conjugate it. And clearly all rules are satisfied. So this one is super important, appears all the time, and it's called action by conjugation. Okay, so suppose you have some element uh, x in g. Let's look at orbit. So orbit of x is, okay, all elements congruent to, sorry, uh, all elements to which you can move by conjugation from x, which is just a conjugacy class, uh, is the conjugacy class of x. So orbit of this section is just a conjugacy class of x. Uh, in particular, uh, if g is finite, then size of any conjugacy class divides the order of G. And, and this is uh, something which was again in homework, I don't remember, three or four, and this was a non-trivial theorem, so there was some bijection and blah blah blah, and this was exactly the orbit stabilizer lemma in this particular case. Uh, by the way, of course, you can look at uh, stabilizer. So, stabilizer of x and g is, with respect to this action, is the same thing as centralizer, which I think we denoted like c g of x, maybe, or something like that. And uh, the centralizer is just this is just set of all elements g in g such that g x g inverse is x elements which commute with with uh, g and so basically all these facts about action by conjugation uh, are uh, are uh, obvious from here and notice in particular this fun fact that basically the fact that conjugation is an action is the same thing as that for every G you have an automorphism of G, which is this inner automorphism. Though, uh, to be honest, it's not exactly the same, because uh, uh, the fact that this is not just a bijection, but an automorphism, that's something you need to check. It's very simple, but it's not a general group action stuff. It's kind of more special here. Okay. So, let's move on. So, um, I wanted to give an application to groups of uh, order P, and again it was in the homework, but let's kind of go through it from this perspective. So, imagine G uh, is a group of order P power N, where P is a prime, of course, P is prime. So, such things are called P groups. When you start studying group theory, you might think that P groups are the most simple kind of groups because, you know, I mean, groups of order P are cyclic, groups of order P squared are abelian, and groups of order 8 are relatively easy to classify. So you, you start to see that groups of order P power something are the most accessible to you. And the hardest groups are all the symmetric groups and GLN and whatever. But actually, it's quite the opposite. So uh, groups which are simple, uh, humanity, in general kind of understands, at least in big part. And groups which are of this type are completely wild. Their number grows like crazy when n grows, and their complexity grows, and it's not so easy how to classify them, and their number is not known. So this is a very, very complicated subject, and in general in math you usually say wild when you have such kind of very tricky for classification phenomena. Anyways, but 
from this perspective, something simple happens. So G is a group of order P power N, where P is prime. So, by our previous theorem, every action of G on anything, um, any action of G on absolutely anything has P power K uh, uh, sorry, has, has orbits has orbits of size P power K from K from 0 to N. So what it means, it means that basically there are these orbits of length 1, fixed points, and then orbits of length p, p squared, p cube, and so on. And so you see that basically the number of fixed points is congruent to uh, the size of the set, mod p. Let's just derive that. Okay, so, so for any action of g on a finite set X, we can write down some uh, congruence. Size of X is congruent mod P to number of fixed points. Uh, just because all other orbits has have size p times something or p squared times something or whatever, and your set is the joint union of these orbits. So you start to see kind of interesting number theory can get out of this group theory, and um, that's pretty remarkable. So, uh, okay, application. So theorem, which again wasn't homework, uh, a p group, has a non-trivial center. So I remind you, center is a set of elements which commute with everything. And the proof is just one line. So a P group G. So G acts on G by conjugation. Um, so, by this theorem, the order of G is congruent mod P to the number of fixed points. But what is a fixed point? So, some element X in G is a fixed point, point of the section if um, okay g times g uh, uh, x g inverse is equal to x for any g uh, which means that x is inside the center so the set of fixed point is just the center so order of g is congruent mod p to the size of the center. And you might say, okay, but why it's interesting, probably center has no elements. But the funny thing is that center always has at least one element. I mean, identity is always there. So it means that actually that's not empty. So uh, the, the center is not just identity, because if it were just identity, it would have just one element and it should have the same element mod p, so in particular, ah, sorry, in particular, yeah, it's just divisible by p here, so that's the only thing you can say, so, and, and, p divides the order of the center. 